Amen. I would imagine most Americans remember a story that we all had read to us when we were young. It was called The Little Engine That Could. It's a story of a locomotive who is pulling a bunch of train cars which are full of toys. And uh, they are headed to a village of kids who are toyless. Now what happens is that the locomotive pulling the train realizes there's a huge mountain uh, between their current location and the village that they're going to. And so the locomotive says, I'll never make it up uh, the mountain, so I'll try to find a more capable, higher horse-powered locomotive to take my place. And so this locomotive approaches several high-powered engines that could easily do the job, but none of them are willing. They all have excuses. And they don't care about the poor kids on the other side of the mountain getting their toys or not. And just when all hope was almost lost, that's when an undersized engine that was only ever built to move empty rail cars around a small rail yard realizes that all the other kids, all the kids on the other side of that mountain aren't going to get their toys unless someone volunteers. And that's when this little lo locomotive says, I'll do it. And that's when all the other locomotives begin to mock and begin to jeer and to begin to make fun. In your dreams, they say. But the little locomotive backs up and gives it a try, and at least he's able to get the other train cars moving on the flat ground. But the real test lies ahead. Everybody knows it. There's a huge mountain up there, and everybody remembers what happens next. It applies maximum effort for this challenge, and it's huffing, and it's puffing, and then in a moment of determination, he begins this chant, saying this one sentence of resolution over and over and over that we all remember from half a lifetime ago. Say it with me if you remember. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And with a will of iron, the little engine makes it up to the top of the mountain. And as soon as he gets to the village with the kids, they get their toys. And he says, I thought I could. I thought I could. I thought I could. Friends, that's called perseverance. That's called tenacity. That's called discipline, and it matters in life. And if we're going to have a body that honors God, we're going to need that kind of endurance, that kind of discipline, that kind of self-control. We're going to need an unremitting resolve if we're going to honor God in this area, because it's not going to be easy. Now, the, the arch enemy of tenacity is comfort and ease and a commitment to shortcuts and the enjoyment of coasting and really whatever requires the least amount of effort from us. And so if you're somebody who gives up quickly or if you've always had it easy in life or if you had parents who avoided giving you any kind of challenges when you were little and they made your life as easy as possible, they didn't do you any favors on this one. Because the truth is, the only way to get healthy, the only way to lose weight, is to eat better and to exercise more. If you want to know the secret to a healthy body, that's it. Eat better, exercise more. That's exactly what it is. But as simple as that is to understand, it's not that easy to do. And so today I'd like to look at a passage or a few passages from the middle of your Bible, the book of Proverbs, that talks about this character named the sluggard. If you'd like to pull out your outline, I've printed those verses there for you. Uh, but before we look at God's Word, I want to really make this personal, because some of you don't struggle in this area uh, physically, like I do, but perhaps you struggle in some other area, uh, and perhaps you might like to personalize it by just filling in the blank at the top of your outline, which simply says this, if you're honest, I have trouble controlling my blank. Uh, fill in the blank. I have trouble controlling my emotions. I have trouble controlling my diet. I have trouble controlling my temper. I have trouble controlling my uh, eating, my drinking, my anger, my lust, my financial spending, my debt, my clutter. 
I have trouble controlling my schedule. I'm late all the time. And so um, I have trouble controlling my blank. And you don't have to write it in, but make sure you have something in your mind. And uh, be honest with yourself, because we all struggle in one way or another. And my invitation for you this morning is just, would you give God permission uh, to speak to you about that area? Because I believe he will. Now, let's get introduced to this character we uh, learn about in the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to begin with a verse from chapter 21, verse 25. And it's up there on the screen, and it's also in your bulletin. The writer says this. The desire of the sluggard puts him to death, for his hands refuse to work. And right away we learn that the sluggard has these desires. And um, he has no control over these desires and no self-control. And so that's the first point that we learn. The sluggard has no self-control. He has no inner strength. He or she has no power. They say yes when they should say no. They say no when they should say yes. They say yes when they should say no. They say no when they should say yes. They give in to temptation. They're characterized by indulging these desires, self-indulgence. And as a result, the verse says things don't end well for this sluggard, right? Their desires end in death. It's not that they plan it that way, but that's the sad thing. This... This whole situation was preventable, but it says here that he refuses to engage in hard work. And so we learn here that there's a a willfulness as well. Uh, The sluggard is also stubborn. Uh, They are choosing, they are refusing to work. It's not that he can't do it, it's that he won't do it. Big difference there. And so here's the thing. God has created us with a, a degree of freedom. And uh, freedom to choose. And yes, there's forgiveness when we, when we make mistakes and choose the wrong path. But there is also consequences for sin, especially in the physical area, isn't there? And I know God's heart is to be merciful, but also God is here, I think, saying, why don't you just spare yourself all the pain and obey me in these areas? Uh, and why do you have to learn the hard way? Why don't you just trust me? Because here's the thing, there is consequences for sin. Yeah, there's grace, but I think God wants what's best for us. And, and the pastor's heart inside of me feels the same way. I, I just think, you know, you can't get some components of your health back. You can't get your, your 20s and 30s back. You, you can't go back and have those years when your kids were little. There, there are natural consequences to, to sinning. Opportunities pass, and God wants to spare us the grief. And sometimes years are wasted by just going my own way. And so consider the gravity of that because God wants what's best. The next uh, proverb I'd like to look at is from chapter 26. It's uh, an interesting proverb that at first may not make a whole lot of sense to you. So I'd like to just show it to you and then explain it. It says this, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so the sluggard turns on his bed. What in the world is going on here? Well, what you realize if you study the commentators is there is no actual lion in the street. This is about somebody back then who made up excuses to remain lazy. It's an excuse. They claim they're afraid... And so therefore they want to stay in bed. It's an irrational excuse. I mean, think about it. Suppose there really was a lion in the street. Would the correct, proper course of action be to remain in bed? No. You would sound an alarm. You would tell someone about the lion. You would try to get help. The sluggard is making irrational excuses to remain lazy. The sluggard is full of excuses. You ever meet those kind of people? The sluggard is full of all kinds of excuses, whether they make sense or whether they don't make sense. They always find some excuse, find someone else to blame. They blame it on the weather. I can't run outside. It's too cold. I can't go out there. It's too hot. It's raining. It's not raining. There's always a reason why they can get out of exercising. Any weather will work, really, for this. Or they just blame their emotions. I just don't feel like it today. 
I'm really down. I got to eat ice cream. That's the only way I know how to comfort myself. Always blaming something or someone for their inactivity. You know how you spell blame? Be lame. And when you're making excuses, you're being lame. And the sluggard is always making an excuse. And the second part of this proverb is also a little tricky to understand. It says he's like a door on a hinge. A door on a hinge. Well, a door doesn't really go anywhere. It moves a little bit. Kind of like the sluggard lying in bed. Just flopping around. Right, left, back. Right, left, back. Right, left, back. He never gets out of bed. He's too sacrilegious. All right, that was a bad joke. <laughs> it's a matter of mind over mattress. Okay, these are the jokes. Folks. <laughs> so what we learn here is that the sluggard is lazy. Can we say that together? The sluggard is lazy. In the Proverbs, the sluggard is somebody who's utterly undependable, uh, lazy. They uh, refuse to get going. They're characterized by inactivity. And my favorite commentator on the Proverbs, Derek Kidner, gives a, a, a very good definition of the, the sluggard in his commentary where he says this, it's a delicious drowsiness which a little respite cascades into massive destruction. And so the Bible says God is displeased with the sluggard. Another proverb is found in chapter 25. Although it doesn't use the word sluggard, it certainly describes how they are. It says, like a city without walls is a man without self-control. Now remember, the walls of a city were very important for protection, especially back then. Remember in Nehemiah's time, they had to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah heard that Jerusalem's walls were broken down, and he wept because of the danger there. He knew that a city without walls was in trouble. That city was in danger of being overrun by robbers. It was in danger of being overrun by wild animals. Could just come in and wreak havoc. The biggest danger was foreign armies. Could just come in and it was only a matter of time until a city without walls was destroyed. Just like that, the Bible says, a sluggard who has no self-control is in great danger from a variety of sources that could destroy them. The sluggard puts themselves in great danger. The sluggard puts themselves in great danger. Now just think about how true that is even to today. Never before have we had a society with this much obesity, uh, this much diabetes, uh, this many problems with self-control. We've never had this many eating disorders uh, even 50 years ago. The addictions, the, the drug addictions, uh, you know, veer off of the, the food side. Think about the internet pornography addiction that's just plaguing our culture. The violence problems. Our walls of self-control in this culture are weak. And some of them have been broken down altogether. And we're suffering as a result. And so how would you personalize that? How are your personal walls holding up? Is there a weak spot in your wall somewhere? Where do you struggle with self-control? If we're honest, I think we all struggle in one way or another. The solution to this is found in a very, very bizarre place. Chapter 6 gives us the answer. Let me read this for you. Solomon says, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Observe her ways and be wise which having no chief officer or ruler prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and wants like an armed man. Let's camp out here for a moment. There's a lot going on in this text. Solomon observes that the ant, if you're with me, say amen, that the ant during the summer is very busy. They're gathering food. They're gathering grain, one piece of grain at a time. 
and, and they bring them down these tunnels. Anybody ever had like an ant farm? You know what I'm talking about? Where you just kind of watch these things work, how God gave them the instincts to, to do what they do. And they take these you know, morsels of food down these tunnels, down into the dirt to, to store them there for winter. And if you've ever just kind of sat there and watched ants work, you realize this takes a lot of time. It doesn't happen all at once. And so the ant just methodically, consistently keeps on working until that job is done. Now the Lord in his wisdom has endowed the ant with this instinct to know how to do this, which I find to be incredible. But what I want you to notice is that the ant here knows how to plan ahead. The ant knows how to work hard, and, and the writer sets that in contrast with this human being he calls the sluggard, because the sluggard doesn't plan ahead, the sluggard procrastinates. The sluggard says, there's always tomorrow to get that done. The sluggard says, I, you know, someday I will get to that. And then, someday I'll never comes. But what's the rush? Work out? Yeah, I'll do that later when I get around to it. My diet, that starts tomorrow. But then what happens? Tomorrow never comes. But Solomon says, not the ant, though. They're preparing for tomorrow, aren't they? They never forget that tomorrow is coming. Now, just to think about this passage for just a moment. This is a sad commentary on the state of humanity in our fallenness. That a human being, created and made in the image of God, is asked to go to an insect to learn a lesson. But nevertheless, this is kind of a wake-up call for us. Because all of us, from time to time, wrestle with procrastination and act a little bit like the sluggard in one area or another. We don't want to be bothered. We all come up with excuses. We just want to feel and act lazy and comfortable. And the lesson we learn here from the ant is simple. Responsibility and discipline sustain a healthy lifestyle. Can we say that together? Responsibility and discipline sustain a healthy lifestyle. And it's not instant. It's day by day, minute by minute, hour by hour. That takes discipline. It doesn't happen in a microwave. There's no pill that just causes it to just uh, the pounds fall off. I wish there was. But here it says, no, methodically, over time, day by day, this is how you get the job done. Don't put off what you need to do today. Just methodically plug away. You know, I realize this isn't easy. And it isn't easy because once we become adults and once we have other responsibilities in life, we realize life is really busy and it's very hard for us to find the right balance. For me, life is a little bit like a pentathlon. If you know what that is, it's, it's an event where you've got to do five different sports uh, in, in, a, in a row uh, to win this race. Maybe it's swimming, biking, maybe they do a high jump, maybe they do a long jump, and then maybe at the end they do a longer distance run. So a person doing this sport can't, can't just be good at one event, right? They have to practice all five of these different events, and they have to be good at all of them to have success in this area. To be good at a pentathlon is not easy. It takes balance. The modern Olympic event comes from a story about a soldier that actually had to relay a message from the battlefield from his commander. And so he started out on horseback, uh, but his horse got shot out from under him. And uh, then he had to fight one guy with a sword. And then he had to shoot another guy to get through the enemy lines. And then he had to uh, swim across a river, and then on the other side of the river he had to run the rest of the way. That's where the modern day Olympic pattern uh, gets set from, from that story. But isn't that a little bit like our lives? We have more than just one thing to steward and to manage. Many of us have to go to work and plug away at the office, and then we go home and maybe there's some chores to do and we're pulling weeds out in the yard, then we go to church and there's a place to serve for us here at church and there's responsibilities we do there. And then, and then there's 
you know, perhaps things with the children we have to manage, and then, then we're supposed to find time to go to the gym and take care of our physical fitness too. And we've got to find a way to balance all of those things. And that's not easy, is it? That's challenging. And so here's my encouragement for you. Uh, the ant gives us a lesson uh, to, to be disciplined and responsible and to just steadily plot away in all of these different areas. And let me give you a few practical applications toward this end that have been helpful to me. The first one is this. Make fitness a spiritual discipline. Can we say that together? Make fitness a spiritual discipline. We've said in the weeks past that uh, our body is created by and for God. That it's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, Whether you eat or drink, do everything for the glory of God. I heard about a guy who said, here's what I do when I exercise. I go for a walk, and I worship while I walk. And he's describing his routine, and he's like, I listen to my iPod, and, and I put some worship music on, and I do that. And then he said, I get around to this certain curve in my neighborhood, and that I call my praise curve. And whenever I get to that curve, I think of something in my life that I should be praising God for. And then when I get up a little farther, there's this other curve that I call the Thanksgiving curve. And I, I take that time and that portion of my walk to give thanks to God and what He's done for me. And then he said, I've got a supplication curve, and I, I list my prayer requests out when I'm walking around that curve. And there's different people I pray for as I go. And he was describing this whole routine, and I thought, isn't that great to, to turn fitness into a spiritual exercise as well? The second thing I would like to just encourage you about is this. Have a good theology of fitness. Can we say that? Have a good theology of fitness. We are stewards of the body. We said last week that our body belongs to God. We give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but we give to God what is God's. And we are stewards and we're accountable for how we treat these bodies on loan to us. And so we need to remind ourselves that hard work is not a bad thing. Uh, hard work is not a result of the fall. Did you know that? God created us for hard work. Now, toilsome, wearisome, futile, frustrating hard work is part of the fall. But hard work is something that God designed us to do. Hard work leaves us feeling satisfied. You know, it's interesting. I've never gone to the gym and then been driving back home and regretted uh, my workout. I always leave happier. Uh, I always leave feeling satisfied. And if you get into a routine of fitness, I find I'm starting to sleep better. And uh, I'm not really tossing and turning. I, I just feel better. I, I just have more joy in life. And this is how God designed us to work. I read an interesting article this week that said, if you will just get involved with a, a, a short 30-minute cardiovascular exercise three days a week that has the same effect on the brain as taking an antidepressant. I thought, wow, isn't it interesting how God designed us to work? And so have a good theology of fitness. This is how God wants us to honor our bodies. That's important. The next thing I want to share with you is to, to boldly set my new health goals. Can we say that together? Boldly set my new health goals. A goal is important. My favorite definition of a goal is a dream with a deadline. A dream with a deadline. It's not just a dream. It's a, I put a deadline on it. And the truth is, any goal that you have that is, that is serious, that is bold, is going to require a deadline. It's going to require some commitment and, and some motivation. But you can make it happen. Uh, jot down Proverbs 21.5. Solomon says this, Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. And so what is your goal for this fall? What is your health goal in the year 2016? And you could think about that. Perhaps you'd like to think about that when you get home as well. If it's smoking, maybe you want to set a goal about reducing or quitting smoking. If it's pornography, maybe you want to set a goal about breaking that addiction. Uh, if you're like me and it's overeating, maybe your goal is, is tracking how much calories you're taking in and tracking your exercise. But you have to set these goals and, and write them down. There's something I found about writing it down uh, that makes it more serious. And so I would encourage you to set some bold goals. The fourth thing is more practical. Choose a plan. Everybody say plan. A plan that is best for me. We need a plan because, you see, if you, if you, uh, if you don't have a goal followed by a plan, you're really not that serious, are you? And so for this, 
we might need some help. Uh, for this, you might need to you know, make an appointment to go for a physical and see what kind of plan your doctor would recommend for you. Uh, Solomon says in Proverbs 15.22, plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. Would you agree with that? And so maybe you need to ask your doctor. Maybe you need to uh, get a trainer or perhaps get a coach or, or a nutritionist to help you create a plan. A lot of health plans out there fail. I seem to be on a good plan right now, but I, you know, I haven't told you about the plans that I was on that didn't work at all. <laughs> uh, you know, one time I tried this crash diet for like seven days, and I lost some weight. But let me tell you, I also lost a week. Okay, and it was just not realistic. I found that the stuff that they were, you know, asking me to do, I just, I just couldn't live like that. And so there's some uh, hokey plans out there that are not realistic. You got to choose a plan that fits you personally that you can live with. Here's another tip. Start small. Everybody say start small. Start small. If you're starting from scratch, don't go out there today and try to run a 5K. Um, you know, start small, build up to it. Maybe today you just walk for a few minutes and then you build up from there. But here's a principle I've learned. When I demand something of the body, my body gives it to me. If I do two push-ups for five days, on day six I can do four. And so start small and build up. You know what I started doing? I started just uh, taking the stairs as much as possible. I'm going over to the doctor's office, and there I am sitting uh, you know, by the elevator pushing the button saying, what? what in the world? I'm going to the doctor. You know? It's embarrassing. Okay, just, it's one flight up. It's on the second floor. Just take the stairs. And uh, so little things like that. Or, or you know, you're going to uh, the grocery store. Take one of those far away parking spots. It probably cause you less stress anyway. So take, a, take the farthest spot you can find and get a little walk in while you're headed into the store or whatever. But start small and, and kind of work your way up. Next, invest in your fitness. Let's say that together. Invest in your fitness. You know, I'm tighter than the bark on a tree. Those of you who know me, you know that I don't really like to spend a whole lot of money, but fitness does cost you something. You're going to have to spend some money on some decent running shoes. You're going to have to perhaps join a gym, and that kind of stuff is well worth the investment uh, because you really can't do it without spending a little something uh, to get yourself going and get the ball rolling. And then this last little tip I want to share is very important. It's surround yourself with supportive people. Can we say that together? Surround yourself with supportive people. Supportive people. There are some people there that if you share your goal with them today, they will laugh at you. They will make fun of you. They will taunt you. They will uh, try to tempt you uh, with things that you know that you shouldn't eat. They will criticize you. They will be sarcastic. Uh, they will shake their head. They will say, you just can't do that. And you know, the Bible says bad company corrupts good character. Uh, but you've got to have supportive people around you if you want to be strong. Maybe you need a workout partner. I'll tell you what I did. I challenged somebody I know who has the same weight problem I do to see who can lose the most weight by a certain date and the loser buys lunch. So I'm kind of using my pride against my weight, if that makes sense. So, uh, you know, you get somebody who can support you. Uh, it, you know, it makes it kind of fun and, and uh, you know, you're not alone. Because we need support, don't we? And I hope that our church is that kind of place. I want our church to be an encouraging place, a place where we can build each other up. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, So encourage each other and build each other up. Build each other up. I mean, do you want to go to church when you feel like you've been torn down? No, I want to go to a church where I felt like I've been built up. And so that's what we need. We need to support one another. Now let me close with this thought, because all of these things are a, a moot point if we don't involve God the Holy Spirit in the process. Uh, we want to be physically fit, but we also want to be spiritually fit. And ultimately, the very last fruit of the Holy Spirit is the fruit of self-control. It says that He is the one that can produce that kind of fruit inside of my life, which means this, the way I can cultivate self-control in my heart, in my life, in my soul, in my spirit, is directly connected to the work of the Holy Spirit, which is directly connected to the Gospel. Because the reason I could say no to my impulses and my desires and my temptations or your addictions or whatever we struggle with is that I can say to myself, you know, I don't really need that stuff to be satisfied or to be happy. Because in the gospel, I realize I already have inside of me that which will satisfy and ravish my soul the most. And his name is Jesus Christ. 
And so, are you satisfied in Him? If so, why would we trade Him for anything else? You see, the reason why I don't have self-control is because in that moment, I'm not seeing the beauty of Jesus Christ. You don't see that He's so much better than whatever you're being tempted by. And your whole problem is that you don't see how wonderful He is and how wonderful it is to live for Him. And so the way we cultivate self-control as a Christian is distinctly different from the way the world would cultivate self-control. We can say no to any fleshly pleasures because we already have the thing that satisfies our souls the most. And that's the person of Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here today and you're kind of thinking, you know, I don't know. I've had this bad habit for so long. It's too far gone for me. I'm not too sure if it's too late or what, but uh, I don't even know if there's any hope anymore. And let me encourage you with this closing story. Years ago, there was in uh, ancient literature uh, a certain kind of tree written about that had existed in the land of Israel, but it had gone extinct a long time ago. It was called the date palm tree. And the date palm tree, for 3,000 years, uh, provided shade and provided good fruit to the people of God. And all over the Middle East, uh, the date palm tree existed. But then came the Roman army, and they wiped out the date palm tree. And interestingly, after 1,500 years, a group of archaeologists unearthed this jar of seeds, and for 40 years this uh, jar sat in a drawer somewhere until an Israeli university researcher planted one just to see what would happen. And wouldn't you know, it sprouts, and it flowers, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. It's the oldest seed to ever germinate. It grows into what we all thought it would be, a date palm tree. And now we have these things. But I want you to know that just like that, we might not see a whole lot of fruit in our lives in this area. We might not see a whole lot of self-control. And it might seem like it's too late or perhaps there's no hope. And sometimes like that tree, it's like we give up. But I want you to know that if you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is a seed planted deep in your heart and it's never too late for that seed to bear the fruit of self-control in you again. So that's my encouragement for you. Can we pray? I'd like to invite the elders forward as we approach the Lord's table as well. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, we want to honor you with our bodies. Please help us. We commit our actions to you and for the rest of this day, Help us to make the right decisions. Uh, Keep us from temptation. Help me, Lord, not to be characterized like the sluggard, but instead to be methodical and responsible and disciplined like the ant. Help me to avoid the people who tear me down instead of build me up. And we dedicate ourselves to you today. Jesus, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for being with us today. As we approach your table, we do so with humility And we seek to come to you with clean and pure hearts. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.